All right. So basically, what I want to do is I want to talk about um, talk about a, a, um, one of the modules we have. And we'll get back to this in just just a second here. I'm just going to jump over here here really really quick. And uh, as far as interruptions and things like that, yeah, please by all means do interrupt. And if I find that we're going off topic, don't take offense, but I'll, I might bring us back back a little bit as well. Um, so I, I want we we uh, we build uh, a lot of applications and we consult with a lot of a uh, lot of developers, some of them on, on on the channel here. And the common challenge, and we have this in our own products, is um, is how to handle the concept of of what people are allowed to do. So before we sort of get into that, just a bit of uh, nomenclature here. I just want to talk about a couple of things: the difference between authorization, and authentication. And it looks like to me we got this uh, arrow in the wrong, wrong spot here. There we go. All right. So basically, uh, authentication is we actually have these uh, authentication. Yeah, author. Sorry, my mistake. We had it right. There we go. All right. So authorization is basically proving who you are. I think everybody knows that already for the most part. It's the logging in. It's it's uh, identif identifying. And it's not always just about logging in. Sometimes it's a smart token that you might send in an email to somebody that takes them into the application or whatever. Uh, the concepts I'm gonna be talking about today are not just about web apps, although I will be talking a little bit more web app centric for, for uh, just because that's uh, that's what we tend to build a lot of, but this is 100% applicable as a pure file maker. Um, and then there's authentication. Authentication is what the user is allowed to do. And that's where things get kind of tricky. Um, so let's look at a couple of typical stories here. So your app has a different uh, has different users like every app and the users are allowed to do different things. So normally what we do is we set up some type of uh, privileges in FileMaker. And if you've ever got into deep level of the privileges, it can be really, really um, challenging. It's easy enough to set up user privilege uh, user groups in FileMaker, but it's when you get into the table level and the field and record level access, that's when it comes uh, pretty, you're, you're pretty deep in the weeds and it's really, really uh, can be a real challenge. Right, uh, sometimes uh, we have a, a use case where we have um, a group of users, and then we need to give a specific user um, some overrides here. Sorry about that. My, uh, let me just actually, if I think I'll just do this here. And then the other case is we have third party applications. So we have our main FileMaker database as a source of information, right? That's our, that's our source of truth. But then we want to extend that into maybe another third party web app. Maybe you have some web app that's built in another platform. Um, maybe it's a whole other enterprise system that, that you need to extend those privileges into. Um, so we want to, we don't have to replicate those privileges across and, and reproduce those, those, uh, those sets. Sure. We can uh, bring the groups over maybe with some kind of shared authentication system, but that doesn't really bring over what the individual individual privileges that a given user or a group of users or organization for that matter um, can do. Uh, vertical applications are, are really big. We actually have about 25% of our clients have verticals, which is a really, really high number of applications. And verticals are a special challenge because when you have a vertical, not only do you have users, privileges, but you also have um, organizations. And then from a customer support aspect, if you're managing this multi-tenant uh, organization, you need to sometimes give overrides to a specific customer, right? Or maybe it's a specific, specific user within that customer, or maybe it's a user that can jump around between the customers and things like that. So it can be, again, it can be kind of messy. Um, if you guys have different techniques for how you manage this, I'd like to, like to hear about that later on. I'll show you what we, we do. And I think it's a very, very simple, simple, uh, simple system. So just a quick bit about a bit of information uh, about me. Yeah, I have kids. Yeah, I have hobbies. Uh, sometimes I have pets, and that's about it. I'm the founder of Dell's Engineering and FM Better Forms, as you may or may not know. <clears throat> and we'll go on to that. I don't want to spend too much time on that stuff because you probably don't really care too much. Okay, so we have um, we have a very simple module. It's not even really a module. Uh, Ham is actually, <laughs> in all honesty, it's a, it's a concept. It's really, really more of a concept of how to do something rather than rather than a module as such. Uh, we called it HAM because we just wanted a catchy, catchy name and we use it for uh, our applications and it's open source. Here's the GitHub link here. I'm gonna paste that later on somewhere so that you can have access to it, but it's easy enough to find as well. 
right? The idea of ham is that we wanted to keep things simple. I really like elegant programming. When I was uh, studying engineering, one of my, one of my uh, professors, he used to always say, Charles, find the elegant solution. And that really, that's something that really, really uh, resonated with me because uh, I'm, I'm from electrical engineering background, but it's the same thing. You try to find the very minimal amount of components for, for building a circuitry. Um, we don't want, we wanted to have something that's really, really flexible. I don't want to have to reinvent the wheel each time I, I build um, authorization into an application. I don't want to have to think about how I'm going to do it each time because there's so many different use cases. So I wanted something that, that doesn't have an opinion as to, as to how it's implemented and how it's used. Um, I also wanted to be able to implement something into an existing system. Right? We have a lot of systems, the user comes up and says, oh, can you add this one little feature so that they can only see this uh, one box on the screen. They can only see that checkbox if they're a super user, right? Normally we would go in and we would do some kind of visible, visible calculation and we would check some privileges and we'd have the actual code to define whether they, that user can see that attached to that visible calc, right? And if you think about from an architecture of code, now you have this repetition of code and opinion as to your business logic all over your application, which makes it very, very messy in my opinion. Right, so, and we call it uh, vegan friendly only because there's nearly nothing added to your solution. So let's, uh, let's look at these privileges. So let's look at actually some examples of, of um, let me bring this on here, of examples of, of use cases. Um, this is really, really typical. You know, you have a basic user, we would have a manager and maybe an administrator. And you have a list of privileges that the basic user can do. They cannot add users. They cannot edit users. They can change their own information. And they can have one widget, whatever that could be. And then we have a manager. And the manager, of course, they can, they can do a little bit more. They have more privileges. So they can uh, uh, edit users. They can add users. They can have three widgets. And they can uh, do anything a basic user can. And this is really, really key, right? So what we've done here, and if you think about the privileges, we've said the manager can do something that this person can't, but we've explicitly said this person can't do it. So we've inherited some of the use cases out of here, right? In this case, we've written them down twice, but so it's not really an inheritance, but we, we have replicated some of those same features. Administrator can do other things. Maybe they can... Um, add and create, add and delete records, but maybe they're not allowed to edit the data within that record, which sounds really odd, but it, it actually does make sort of sense. If, if a developer might be able to add and delete records, but you don't want them maybe editing something like that. They can do also, they can do anything a super, uh, supervisor can. Um, when we developed this, uh, one of the, uh, one of our team, we were, uh, he, he was uh, at the time we working working at a university. So we sort of used the university uh, school um, paradigm where you have a bunch of people and a teacher is allowed to have a key that goes into their classroom. A teacher is allowed to have a key that goes into the staff room. The dean of the school is allowed to go into any classroom, but they can also go into their office. And the dean can also unlock, unlock their, their file cabinet, their, their, their uh, desk within their, within their office. But the teacher can't do those kinds of things. But then you have these weird edge case scenarios where you have a custodian, right? The janitor, they actually have a key to everybody's, everybody's office because they have to be able to go in and empty the trash, but they don't have a key to one very important thing, which is the, the, the dean's desk. They wouldn't have a, a key to that. So that's a very weird edge case when it comes down to coding permissions. Does that sort of, that kind of concept where you where run into those kind of problems, does that make sense to everybody? I'll take that as a yes. All right. So, um, so if we were to distill this information here, and we were to distill this into a set of Boolean logic, basically, or a truth table, if you will, or even just, if you look at this, it's actually kind of shaped like a JSON object. We have some keys here, and we have some privileges. So if we were to, to take that exact same example, let's distill this down just a little bit. And now I have a JSON object that defines my privileges, All right? I have a basic user, I have a manager, and I have an admin. And then in my basic user, 
I have some set settings, add user false, edit users false, edit own details. That's uh, to be able to change their own state preferences or something. Uh, true, uh, widgets allowed one. Now in my manager, what I've done here is I've said my manager can inherit what? What can they inherit? This is an array, so that means they can inherit more than one thing. And in this case, they only have one example, but the, the manager would be able to inherit the basic user. Now, if you have an organization where you have maybe an, an east uh, branch and a left branch, and maybe the managers uh, drive between the two branches and they can access privileges on both sides, they might have an east coast object here, a west coast object, and the manager would inherit the east and the west because they may be very, very different types of, uh, uh, types of services and privileges and things like that. So this is where the non-opinion comes in in terms of design or architecture of, of, of privileges. And guys, if, you're, if, you're, if, I've, if something's not making sense, by all means, just, uh, just hit the space bar and, and chime in, please. Okay, so now we've got these, these basically, I don't wanna call them cascading, but in a way from the top down, they are cascading or inherited privilege sets. But then we have a certain use case where I could be a manager, but I also, and this is like the janitor example, I am I'm a manager, but I have to fill in for somebody for the evening or for the weekend because uh, they're away on vacation. So I need an extra privilege. I need to be able to modify a certain record or a certain field or something in, in there. But I wanna give that one person because only me, because I'm, I'm filling in for another manager, I need to give them an override. Or maybe for example, the basic user, um, is there and the manager goes on vacation, but we need to give them the ability to edit users while I'm gone. So I need to take one person here that's in this group and give them an override for only a brief amount of time. So that becomes a real programming challenge if you're doing it conventionally with conventional, you know, hide objects and things like that in FileMaker. So here's how we, here's how we can sort of look at that. If we take this object and we really treat every item in this object as, a, as a, uh, a flat Boolean or a flat number, or it could be some other kind of thing that's in here, sum, for example. And we flatten this object, we get something that sort of looks like this. I just did this quick on, on, uh, on my design here, so it, it may, I might have missed a field or something. But basically we have, for a given user, we have add users, false, edit users, false, and so on. That is really the only piece of information that we actually need to, to, um, to design our system. So now if we go into, um, we go into a visible calc where I have a field that I only wanna show um, where it says maybe edit, edit your details here and I wanna put a button or something like that. I can now reference this one key feature. Remember the feature has no opinion as to the user. It only has opinion to whether it's allowed to be turned on and off. So we've removed that, that business logic from the, the control from the, um, from the uh, visible or hide object, I forget what it's called in FileMaker. Um, but we've removed that and we've brought it up into data now, right? We've brought it up into this piece of data and we've defined that user as being part of that data. So this is the key, this is the key takeaway here. All right, so now we have this, this flattened object. We can take this flattened object and or really just a variable that references a flattened object and we can do JSON tests against that. But that's not generally enough to just do like some kind of a JSON test because it doesn't, uh, in other words, JSON get element add users and if true, then we allow something and it false. Um, we don't wanna allow that. We wanna really be able to do a few more things in here too, ideally, because this works for most use cases, but it doesn't work for software as a service. So you've seen the typical pricing pages that a lot of software has, uh, um, something like something like this. You guys have seen all of these kinds of pages, right? We see them on every application that we have. And it's like, how do these companies manage this kind of stuff, right? And some of them have real spaghetti code and other ones probably have really good architecture, but they have all kinds of privileges here, a few privileges there. And if you run a SaaS, one of the things they actually recommend is reevaluating your price every three to six months. So if you actually look at Dropbox pricing and some of these bigger companies, even Netflix, they'll, they'll subtle, make subtle changes to their, to their plans every, every quarter, which is crazy because you can't go into your base code, oops, can't go into your base code and make those changes. So that's why we have to bring this stuff out. So now I can create another plan. So this could be a plan. This could be gold, silver, bronze plan. And these could be the features that come with the plan. 
right? So I hope you see where I'm going with this. Okay, so let's have a look at, 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 at uh, um, how this would actually play out here. So basically what HAM is, is, let me grab, is a module, that's not it, there we go. All right, so basically what HAM is, it's an open source module, and it's not a module as such, it's really and truly three custom functions. Um, but again, it's the architecture, it's understanding why we wanna, we wanna do things like this or why, what problems that this solves. So the, um, our GitHub, if you search for Delphs Engineering and it's a pinned, um, it's a pinned uh, um, repository, you can, you can go there now uh, just in Git. And incidentally, if you don't have a Git account, it's time to open one, right? It's time to open one. Why is it time to open one? Is that way you can contribute to open source software? Sometimes a contribution, this is a shameless plug here, but sometimes the contribution is you've uploaded a new file and you've redesigned the entire application. Other times the contribution is, hey, I noticed a bug in this one file when I do this and I open up an issue. So that's why it's really, really valuable to, um, um, to do that. I'm just gonna mention that really, really quick. Do, do, do. Um, this is just a web viewer here, but this is the same as the Git. Um, so when you go to repositories, you'll see ham here, you click on ham. If you have an issue, you can click on the issues. But like us FileMaker developers, the nature is not, although we all wanna share code and you know we do because we share and all that stuff. But the reality is compared to other industries, we hardly share any code. Right, so we need to start using the main thing that the rest of the world has already solved, which is open source software. And we need to, so we're slowly moving into that direction. But here's, um, if you do have an issue, you can open up the issue in here. What we would prefer if you do find something is that you, um, you uh, submit a, a, what's called a pull request, which basically is, here's a new file with the, with the patch fixed. That's really what it is in terms of FileMaker. So um, let's see, how can we go back? There we go. All right. So basically what ham is, is a set of functions. So let's, um, they're really just three custom functions. And I really thought about what's the easy way to explain this. And it's a little, I think it's a little tricky. So uh, I may not be in the, in the best logical order, right? So ham is a, a three, a set of three basic custom functions. One of them, what it does is it's going to start to flatten out that object, right? The first, the very first thing it does is it takes your set of privileges and it flattens it out into um, or it, it calculates it out, I should say, and it flattens it out for that particular user. So if I say I am a manager, I should get, I should yield this set of results and including these inheritances. And these inheritances can go down deeper and deeper and deeper. They can be, they're recursive, All right? If I'm a manager or sorry, I'm admin, I should get a different set of results. So that's the first thing that it does. Then the second function, is for checking privileges. So let's look at a real world application and how we use ham, and then we'll uh, we'll we'll get in a little deeper from there. Okay, do, 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 do. let's see. I think I have something open already. Okay, all right. So this is a client that we have a web application for, and let me pull up the FileMaker FileMaker file for this in the background. Okay. All right. Can you guys still see this? Is this, uh, did this update to the right screen? I just want to make sure my tracking is. Yes. Okay, perfect. So you're seeing, it should be, it should be a green, green web application with some chart, charty stuff on it. All right. So this is basically an application. It's a multi-tenant application, um, vertical. It's not open to the public, but uh, this company sells um, survey information for palm oil manufacturers in Indonesia. And the companies that they buy to are really, really large, like Cargill and Neste and Pepsi, because they consume a ton of palm oil. Palm oil, they need to track information about where the palm oil comes from, but they're very secretive about, about pieces of information. And they don't want, one company doesn't want to know doesn't want the other company, of course, knowing where they're getting their suppliers and who their, their farmers are and all these kinds of things. The company that manages all of this is who commissioned this, this, this application. Now, yes, this is a web application. So don't say, well, this doesn't apply because that's, the, the logic is still in FileMaker and it's exactly the same. 
So the company has an administrative person and they want to be able to actually change companies. They want to be able, as you see, it says Cargill here, and they want to be able to go into, into here and pick a different company, right? And kick, pick one of these different companies and be able to switch. So they want to be able to do that only for them. That's a one specific user. That's that janitor edge case, right? That I talked about earlier. So that's only one user wants to be able to do that. The actual user of the application should never be able to change companies. That would be a major, major bad thing if, if they were allowed to change companies because you'd be crossing, cross, crossing the information. They also have some extra features. They have some things like accounts and, and there's some other stuff. So let's just go into this very simple concept here. So there's this users. Now, and in a regular user of this application, you don't want them to be able to, to, be able to manage, um, manage uh, things like um, um, users. And you wouldn't want them to be able to add a user in here, right? Uh, that's a regular, a regular user. But an administrator, that's the person who works in this Cargill company, you would want them to have these, these features. So there's, a, there's an example of two different levels. So let's look at FileMaker, how we did that. So this particular app doesn't have any UI, right? We don't tend to, tend to build. If you love FileMaker, try building it without any user interface, right? You're going you're gonna, to you'll be head over heels. OK. Um, so, so if we look here, we have just a preferences table. And look, there's that exact same object that we just talked about. We have a super admin, an admin, and a user. And super admin can manage requesters. That means that they can change between, between um, uh, tenant organizations, can generate survey, notify some other stuff. And the admin can do this. And the user can only see, um, can see all users and can do data entry. And that's it. You don't have to put the falses in there. Um, the custom functions in ham take care of the falsiness. So if something doesn't exist, it naturally defaults to not allowed, right? So that's one of the things that um, from a naming convention, somebody made a funny comment the other day about, you know, whose naming conventions that we do, that we use. And if I can find it here. Um, and uh, it really, you, we, want, we want to pick these keys and you should always be doing this anyway. You should always be picking keys that are more truthy or permissive like they can do this, not cannot do this. So you wouldn't want to say cannot access a Bitcoin wallet true, right? Well, which one is that? What does that mean? Does that mean I'm allowed to access it or I cannot access it? So that's true. So there's always ambiguity there. We want to, we want to pick things that make sense. Has access to wallet true. That's, there's hardly any, any, any confusion there in terms of names. So we have this set of names here and this is our basic configuration. The reason we call this a headless module is because there's no UI. And really, honestly, you don't need any UI for this kind of stuff here. You, you, this is something that you're not going into change very often. The client may come to you and they may say, oh, can you actually add, can you add a new privilege set, um, you know, um, um, can org a nice party, right? And then you might say something like that, you know, that kind of, that kind of an idea. Um, so then you can go, you can go in very, very easily and you can add that in here, but you don't really need that. That is not a, a generally a front facing thing. If you have a use case where you need to put some UI, it's just JSON. You can put any kind of UI you want on there and you can be creative, but otherwise there's no reason to it. All right. Now let's just go into one more thing here. I just want to go into my users table and yeah, that's me. So you can see, here's my, here's my group that I belong to. So in this case, I specified in the user, we add one more field and we say that, what group am I in? I'm in part of the super admin group, but I can easily change that to a user. And I have to spell it right. There we go. And if I was to go over to here, let me just refresh that. I just wanna make sure I've got the right thing here. Yeah, user. And you notice this time I just refreshed this screen and now I'm a regular user. Look, there's no option to change. There's no option in the invite, but they can see all the other people in part of their team because that, that was a, a business logic choice, right? So that all came again, this web logic, totally separate system from FileMaker. The logic all came from FileMaker, right? So the way we implement this is pretty, pretty easy. Let me jump to a different demo here for a second. Then we'll come back to this one. How are we doing for time? Let me take that. All right, so this is the demo file that comes with ham. It's a little bit it's a little bit crude. We didn't have time to paint it or to build it to scale, but um, you can you can uh, it's an engineering joke. Um, you can um, um, by all means, if you're 
creative, you want to change some, something around, pull the file down, make the changes, and uh, submit it up again. We really appreciate it, Ryan. All right, so here's pretty pretty simple the way it works. We start off with a privilege set, and these are the different types of privileges. And I have some example mock users here. And these users, uh, Charles is an admin, Joe, Blo Blo Joe Bob is a basic user, and Eric is a manager. So right now, let's start with, with Joe here. And you can also have overrides, right? So Joe is allowed to be late. Right, Joe is allowed to barbecue. All right, so those would be overrides that only, only, only apply to Joe, not even to the manager, not into anybody else, but to that one specific user, not to the entire group of, of users. All right, so that's the first thing we do is we set this up and we define what the users are. If you want user level access or user level, user level granularity, we just add an object in here with the, with the Booleans in here. And we specify which one it is. So there's one, two parts here. So the first part is in your preferences table. The second part is in your user table and what the user is. Then we run at the beginning of that user session in FileMaker. So that's usually typically when they log in, when you change users, um, you know, when they open on first window open after they've, uh, after you've established and you're setting up your, your global environments. We run ham setup and ham setup generates this flat object. That says flat object here based on Joe's, Joe's preferences. So allowed to barbecue, you can see that it came out as true here. If we were to generate the object for the admin person here, uh, there is no allowed to barbecue. So because it's a Boolean, it's, just, it's presumed that they're not allowed to. Okay, does that make sense so far, guys? All right, then finally, so we run this, we instantiate, we instantiate the user's privileges one time per that session. And then finally, we can run tests against it. So this is a third custom function. This is a this is a second. Sorry, this is the first one. This is the second one. The third one is just a utility function that has more of the code because there's a bunch of code in here. And this final one, we we take any particular user, like add users. So if I want to check this, add users, and if I run a quick test, ham check and comes up to be one. So in FileMaker now, if we were to do ham check privilege add user and do a visibility calculation on that, that particular field would show up, right? If I change this and add some extra stuff in here, uh, let's see, yeah, it throws an error and it's saying, basically saying it's an invalid privilege name. Ham has debugging for you built into it um, as well. I forgot about that. Um, so this saying is that you've called a privilege set that doesn't, that doesn't uh, come up. Now, how are we gonna see this error when this privilege set is attached to a um, hide object when, or uh, conditional visibility. It's gonna be very hard to see. So it actually surfaces in the, um, it actually surfaces in the global variables space and you can see ham last error. So the ham, the error actually surfaces out for you. Right, ham uses global and the before you jump globals um, for, for consistency across your, your application. Now, what's nice is here is I, I just mentioned two things. Okay, so first of all, you say, "Oh, it uses globals." I heard you can hack globals. Absolutely, you can. So we've also built in the ability to um, to encrypt the global ham object settings, so you can't hack them. Okay, I mean, you can look at the code of how that works, and that's also documented in the um, in the GitHub repo as well. If you're worried about somebody hacking that, um, it is a custom function. If they have the ability to hack the custom function, they've they're already totally invaded your system anyway. Okay, Night, one other thing here as well is since the ham privilege, the, the setup is, or ham config here, since this is strictly just a global object or an object, a variable, you can pass that into other areas of your code base. So if you have a multi-file solution, you still have ham only in one place, you just have to pass this one object into that other, into that, those other files uh, when, before you run the code. Uh, a couple other things here. There's a couple other things that get instantiated as well. Um, some of this stuff is really just for this uh, for this demo, so you can take you can take this apart and see. And there's a few other really neat features that are built in here. But let's let's jump back to this other application here, and let's look at how this worked. All right. So how this is a third-party application. 
it's actually running a script in FileMaker, but when it fetches this information and it underneath the hood, it basically just needs to know that ham object. So if we were to look underneath the hood here, you can actually see it right here, sitting up, up under here. These are some development tools that are turned on in the framework here. But you can see that this data is passed through. That is the same permissive data that ham object, your set of permissions that have been passed over to this, this system. And this, if you've ever built web apps, one thing to always keep in mind is everything in the, in the app is hackable. So that means FileMaker needs to actually still check. Just because you hide it here doesn't mean that somebody couldn't hack into this into, a, into the browser and, and send the information, right? My, uh, my son uh, realized one day he, he could go like this and he could go into his bank account and he could, you know, he could find something and, and change the numbers and he sends it to his buddies, you know, and of course he does it with video game scores. Hey, look at what I scored and all this kind of thing. So it's a classic example, very easy. It doesn't take much to figure out how to hack the front end, but it doesn't matter for us. So let's go back into to the back end here and to see how we've used that here. We've already run that ham check privilege, or sorry, ham uh, configure. So that basically build that flat object. And then in some scripts, we have some scripts in here. And this one here is called invite new user. This is the uh, this is a script that gets run basically when, when the user you click um, invite, it sends like a, a mail through a mail company and it adds the user into here and it sends an, the invitation and so on. We want to make sure that you're not allowed to hack that. And the reason that's important is it's again, this is a multi-tenant public facing application. So you have to think about security when you're building stuff that's more public. You have to think about that a lot more than you do within the confines of your employees, right? And employees you can assume to be truthy or faithful, trustworthy, and uh, public you assume the opposite. All right, so it's pretty simple. It's literally one line of code in here. Right, uh, we use a single loop error trapping. I think somebody's talking about error trapping. Uh, they're probably gonna look at that concept, I'm sure. Um, so this is a single loop error trap and it basically says ham exit loop if. And then if we look at this here, let me do this here. Come on baby, there we go. There we are, okay. I can tell how often I use this machine here. All right, so if we look at this, there, you can just ignore this. This is just a placeholder in case we wanna add some more information without changing the function too much in the future. So it's basically saying, if not ham check privilege, can manage users, right? So I check the privilege, can manage users. And if, if it's falsy, which is true, um, then we're just uh, sending, we're returning, we're setting a global variable that, that, that will show an alert. That this doesn't really matter. This is whatever you, however you want to handle this in your own code. This is from a scripting aspect. Um, doesn't really matter. In better forms, it's it, to, to show an alert, it's just uh, uh, adding a, a custom function that's just basically with some parameters. So that's just setting an alert and it's exiting the script. And that's all we need to be super secure because the user can't be spoofed. We know who the user is. They've logged into FileMaker or they've logged into the third-party system. We're assuming the authentication, um, um, the authorization, sorry, section, authentication section is solid. And then we're deriving their, their privilege set from here. We don't take any, anything that comes into the script as for granted. We're actually calculating it here. So that's, just, that's how you, you would use something like that. This one here has delete user. We want to make sure nobody random can delete user. So it's, one again, one line of code in here and you can delete the uh, you can delete the user and that's just almost the same idea basically it's saying if ham check proved can manage users because if they can manage users they can they can delete them ham can be used in a whole bunch of places you can use it right down to the record level access because it's a custom function right so it's a, just a reference and whenever that gets evaluated it's going to check the information um, you can you can see how how it works in, in a little bit more detail. I want to mention one more thing before we just take some questions. Do do do. Let's go back over to here. And um, there's a couple other things that Ham can do as well. When you have a, um, we use this for some vertical applications, and in verticals, quite often the different tiers, you know, gold, silver, bronze, have different volumes of items. The gold one has one widget. The silver has. I guess, so the gold has three widgets, the silver has two widgets and the bronze or whatever, it would have one widget. So how do you handle things like add-ons? I wanna add on something. I wanna give one user extra widgets, 
right? That's really, really challenged. Normally you'd probably go and you'd say the extra widgets and you create some fields and all kinds of garbage like this in your system just to handle that one, one weird edge case. But with him, it's really easy. All you have to do is you say widgets allowed, but you don't just say widgets allowed like this. You say widgets allowed underscore sum, all right? S-U-M, not S-O-M-E, S-U-M, like summation. And what, what that will do is ham smart enough that it'll go through. And when you inherit from here, it'll take these widgets quantity and summarize them into this one. So instead of having three widgets, you have uh, four widgets for this particular user, right? So it be it basically, you can do some basic math like that. You can also do some other things as well. Let's say you had a, a weird edge case and this did come up that maybe on a Tuesday, the user is allowed to do something, but they're never allowed to any, any other day. Right? How the heck do you define that and not have to change it in a million spots in your system? Again, it's global here. You can put ham underscore exec execute and or no eval, sorry, my mistake, and it'll evaluate the parameter that you passed in. So you can say day of week equals Tuesday, and then ham will only be be truthiness on that particular Tuesday. So there's a ton of flexibility there. You don't have to inherit things if you don't want. You can keep them all flat. I personally like that kind of inherited type structure, but it doesn't make any difference. It has no opinion again. And uh, there's a few other little things in here, I think as well. Our documentation is okay, but uh, we welcome to welcome uh, contributors. We've had a couple contributors so far, but we welcome more, please, by all means. Um, there is some stuff about the encryption and things like that, if that's a concern that you're sending out this uh, uh, file to somebody else, or you know they have more access to it, they can somehow read globals or whatever they can do. Um, and I think that is ham more or less in a uh, in a in a in a nutshell. Does that make sense to you guys at all? How it works? Yep, that makes perfect sense. And uh, to answer your initial uh, question, Charles, uh, yeah, I've done something uh, similar, but much more extensive. Um, so the implementation was similar to yours. Uh, I didn't think of the inherit thing that. A very nice idea. I hope I had this idea uh, earlier. But what I did was uh, I separated the whole uh, database into modules. So I grouped tables into modules and uh, using the execute SQL uh, to build virtual schema, the tables automatically populate and then someone needs to assign them into a module. And uh, instead of uh, you're using something like attributes. Can uh, that user view something uh, in my implementation? That was just purely an example. I mean, it can be yeah. anything. I, that's two, those yeah, yeah, yeah. The most common thing is hiding things on your display and prevent, permitting scripts to, or conditionally running scripts. Those are the most yeah. common. For my use case, it, the requirement was to generally uh, handle everything. So I used the crude method so for every module, there is a create, update, read, delete, mm -hmm. because there, were, there are users that they can uh, view records, but they cannot edit them. And there was a very uh, specific requirement that for some tables, users could not delete records, but if they uh, created that record in the last hour, they could delete it. So- Right, so that's a great example. And this is where you could use ham super easy as well. Exactly, we do the same thing. We do that. We we build. We don't even. We don't touch any records. We have one script only in the entire system. Um, generally, when we code something, this is this is there's a little bit of cruft in here, but this is the app that build that runs a web application plus another application on top of it. And we do the same thing. We use like a, a selector basically for the uh, creating and for the deleting. And then you can throw ham at the beginning of that script and check the user that particular user's privileges. You can check other things like that. Is exactly the same. So one of the one of the reasons why we wanted to um, to not use tables and anything anything heavy like that is because it has to be effortless to implement. Otherwise, you're never going to go back, and you're just going to keep going with your old existing system. It needs to play fair with all of the existing privilege sets that you can have without having to go back and I'm going to I'm going to gut everything and I'm going to put this new system in. Right, we want to be able to use as little or as lot as or as much as you want. And Charles, can I jump in? Please. 
Um, so one, th thank you for uh, for sharing. I, I've been um, uh, awaiting for for something like this for quite some time. Uh, I've been using basically extended privileges, and it lets you do uh, feature flags like like what you've uh, what you've mentioned. Uh, but there's a, a great deal of things that are limited, uh, e even down to the the naming that you can or cannot use. Um, so, uh, would would you mind sharing a bit more about um, the inheritance and and what happens when you yeah. flatten stuff up uh, and the, the logic there? I'm, I'm yeah. I don't want to be um, uh, I don't know what what we're doing in in time and and things like that. But I'm I'm really curious about that part and and. Really, kudos for the stuff like you mentioned that the summation and um, and uh, execute. Uh, one side question I would have is, um, you said you're you're not using in into fields, but you could very well um, implement fields that would be unstored counts uh, that say, hey, uh, can you allow? Oh, absolutely, edit, yeah. Ed editing this thing. record. And and then you you would put your custom function in there and and it would be for every privilege set it would still apply so exactly yeah no it has it has no opinion so I, I just use it the, we only use it in a handful of places but it was architected such that it's I haven't seen a use case where it wouldn't work so far without with a and, you know so the, the idea is that it's light and you can use it for anything now of course it's very developer centric you have to understand the concept of JSON you have to understand the um, you were asking about the inheritance, uh, and I think Jens uh, uh, was, was was as well. I think that's who it was, or was it uh, uh, Stathis, maybe? I'm not sure. Somebody was just asking about that. So basically, if you think about object assign in JavaScript, how that works, ham is basically, we built an object, the, the, sub, the custom function, one of the sub functions is an object assign. So it will take an existing object that has keys, and it merges. Object assign is a JavaScript function, um, uh, a slightly newer function that basically does merging. So it takes one object and, and it, if the fields are existing, it'll replace the existing ones. And if something is new or something is old, that will still, that will still um, prevail. And you can object assign a whole bunch of levels. So ham does the same thing. If you're, in, in, uh, if you're inheriting three levels of, three levels of, um, of objects or of, of, permission sets or plans or whatever you want to call these it can be anything you want. And incidentally, you don't have to put true and false. You can put objects, it's JSON. So you can put objects and data in here, Ham will return that data. So if you want to say, what is the, um, what is the prefix for a certain user, right? And if I'm a super admin, it's going to say, you know, it's going to say holy user or something like that in front of his name every time or her name in front of every, every time they use it. You can do that and put that prefix in here. It's not opinionated to Boolean data, to mathematical data. It's just data and it can be an object again. You can return uh, return an actual array of data you want. But that, so, that's gonna change how you're gonna use the custom function tremendously in, in the calls. It's, it's just gonna like readability wise, it's gonna impact uh, a bunch of things, yeah, I guess. Yeah, but, but the, here's the thing though. Um, it's, it's, if you have that use case for doing something like that, then you're the developer, you get it. Right, I don't have a use case personally for returning a list of functions, but there are stuff. One one user had a day days of the week, and what days of the week is this person allowed to log in on? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then another user managed the other user group B was uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, kind of thing. So that's a classic example again of of returning data. In that case, they used a, a, an object as well. So that's how the inheritance works. It's basically it's an object assign but it also runs through and it looks for these underscore calculations, sorry, not calculations, but underscore eval and underscore sum so that it can, can carry up those numbers up to the, uh, to the higher level. Hey, Charles? Yes. Uh, is this only for uh, FileMaker authentication or can it be used? Yeah. <laughs> you know um, what I'm getting at. Technically, um, I was, even I get, I get those, I always trip on the both of those two, but the authorization versus authentication. Um, so the we use it for we, we, it's FileMaker derived. So in other words, the source of truth comes from FileMaker, but we can take that derived object, which is the we'll call it the permissions, 
and we can pass that into any other system. And then, then like if you have a somebody who's building some front end in a different language, you say, here is the object. All they have to do is query FileMaker, return that object. And now the privileges, deep levels of privileges and, and all the, con the, the flexibility comes from FileMaker, but the other developer can easily implement it because it's just Boolean stuff in, in, in a lot in an object. I was referring more to um, Active Directory, Open Directory. Yeah, that's see, see, that's that's the funny thing. That's that's a little different, right? So you're really talking about user groups, but this is really dealing with what does a specific group, or more importantly, what is a specific user or a specific tag in the group or anything like that. What do they have the ability to do? Right, and the, and the real flexibility here is just about about the um, overrides. You know, you can override a specific client, right. a specific user, or a specific person, or anything you want. Again, no opinion. Uh, we do have some things about best practices. I mentioned them a little bit. Don't write. Don't use a key called disabled. Disabled true is disabled is false. It's not. It's a little bit. You know, is active. You know, try to have a, um, um, a, a, a word that describes it a little bit, a bit better. You know, can access this um, count of widgets, that kind of thing. You know, Charles, several years ago, I, I don't know if you remember when John Sindelar used to do those best tricks of the year kind of thing. He would do these sessions at DevCon. And I remember, I think it was when uh, Base64 encoding came out. Uh, Todd guys discovered that you could basically feed a found set into base 64 encoding and using that technique, he could tell if a summary report that he ran last month had changed at all this month. And so he would base 64 encode the two things and store, you know, basically fingerprinting the thing. And then he could detect change. And I was wondering, you know, you were talking about these things being stored in globals and, you know, you could encrypt those to defeat that but you could also sort of honeypot it. So you could set your global fields, base 64 encode them. So you have essentially a checksum. And then every time you go to interpret one of those, you, you know, check the checksum. It's like, is the base 64 encoded version of the current settings the same? And if it's not, all of a sudden you have the ability to detect if someone's trying to tamper with your ham. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um... I wonder, I don't even know if you need to change anything for that because you could check that information. Um, like where, where we use ham ourselves, like we used it for our clients, but where we use it ourselves because we do a lot of dog fooding, like our product is based out of our product or built out of our product. And um, where we use it ourselves is actually for, for uh, uh, user permissions. Like how many, how many um, items, widgets are you allowed to have for, from a, um, roles and then quite often you know a, a, a given dev you know asks, hey can you do this and they have a very edge case and we need to do we just create a quick override I think um, so what we what I was going with this is we actually during the configuration we kind of turn ham sideways it's kind of hard to explain but we, we kind of use it slightly differently um, and inherit these these plans and I guess you could take that whole thing and you could summarize it as well. But the thing is, um, um, if you have access, like the globals, there are, apparently there's some techniques that you can get access to globals. Um, it doesn't really matter here. If they can get access to scripts or if they can get access to your custom function uh, um, um, uh, declarations, then they've already got access to your system. So you're done anyway. Yep. Well, I thought it'd be an interesting idea to sort of leave low hanging fruit and global variables as kind of a honeypot so that if somebody tried to tamper with them, you could immediately be notified someone's trying to tamper with your system. And so yeah, you can, you can, well, you, anytime a privilege doesn't evaluate, you could always, you know, you could always log that as well. I just want to mention something really quick here is ham is does come with some tests. So there's a bunch of tests that you can, um, if you do decide to add a feature or change something. Um, please do write a test or you find that there's a fault with it. Uh, the tests are pretty easy. All you have to do is you can follow basically what these other ones do. You know, this one here is loop through multiple user groups and it's making sure that you can have multiple user groups. So they, they, uh, there's a let function that gets evaluated. This is the expected, this is the actual. And then um, you basically can, can run the tests. And when you run all the tests, it, it calculates everything. 
and they all pass, right? So if you do find a bug, write a test for it at least so that it doesn't so it fails and then submit that. And then at least somebody can go in and, and, and hack it up. Does anybody yeah, have any other questions? What are they? I was going to make the comment that the interesting thing about the FileMaker community is it's almost like a, a, a closed terrarium, you know? Anyone with sufficient expertise to hack this, you probably know them. And so yeah. <laughs> possible uh, antagonists is a, a, a narrowed down one. As you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of devs though. Like I've worked with so many devs, and there's so many that we we never have met. Like there there's a ton of and they're really excellent, and they just they're not in the they're not in the loop. Like you know, we've all seen each other's faces, heard each other's names, and things like that here for the most part. But there's ones that you've never heard of, and it's like, wow, that's really good. Like this guy's really good, or this this woman's really really good. You know, just you just never hear about them because they're not they're not in the they're not in the forums or they're lurking out there. Okay, well, that's, uh, I hope that, uh, I hope you guys can find some use out of it. And please, by all means, uh, I'd love to see this, this contributors uh, thing kind of grow here. Um, other than just the three. <laughs> but uh, we haven't really promoted this as the first, uh, we've had this for a few years. And honestly, since we wrote it, we haven't had to change. We changed one thing once um, a few years back, and we haven't had to change anything else because it's been flexible enough. Um, but um, I'm sure the more people that we expose it to and the more people can get some use out of it, then, uh, um, um, you know, we'll find some, some more issues perhaps. Yeah, sort of circling back to your point about getting notified if there's an empty value where there should be a value. Uh, it'd also be interesting to tie this into like a Zabbix notification system so you could get an alert like, hey, something's wrong with your configuration over there. Yeah, you can, um, we can definitely say if, a user has tried to run a process like that delete, for example, delete user. If a user has tried to run the delete user script and they don't have privileges, there's two faults. There's, there's or two things going on. One is they shouldn't have been able to run that script in the first place. And then two, why is a user who's not allowed to running it, running it there? So one is probably some kind of thing on the front end or some kind of hacking going on. So you can definitely alert a flag at that point. You can say, uh, we know who you are kind of thing. Um, you're, you're definitely hacking, especially when it's an open, open front end. Charles. Yes, sir. Hi, it's Paul Jansen here. Um, do you have any view on how you would use this if you have a lot of different sort of privileges and rules like you might have can delete on a per table basis, or you might have, I don't know, I've got a system where we've got about 50 plus specific actions that individual people might have access to. And so, whole, so the whole managing of that um, yes. core yes. data of HAM is, becomes yeah. more complicated. It, it does. And, and if you do need to, if you do have a use case where, um, where the user needs to, the front end, uh, the public, needs to define the wrong one here needs to define these privileges because this is because this is json you can arrange this in terms of data and check boxes in a virtual portal type of an idea and you could you could give them access to that and even create their own new ones but the problem is you can't just create a new privilege set because that has to be somehow hardwired into your into your code at some point yeah. um, but if they wanted to say, well, we don't want the people on the West Coast to access our, our lunch, uh, lunch menu uh, on the East Coast because then they're making fun of us and you know, whatever, then you can, easily, you can easily add that feature in here and they could turn it on and off if, if, they, if they wanted to, if you needed to put a user interface. I think most of the time you don't need to. This object can be as deep as you want and it can be as big as you want. And you don't have to, if you find inheritances or too confusing, like this one is going three level deep. This is inheriting from here to here to here. And if, if it's hard to, with some use cases, it may be really hard to wrap your head around, well, what can, a, what can admin do? I don't have to dig down and figure out what they can do. I can just explicitly say, I can just copy this here and put this under my admin section and that's what they can do. And I don't have to worry about the inheriting part. Right? We use the inheritances because if we change, we had a new feature. So we had a new feature in better forms, for example. And we want to make that available only to certain plans. We can go back into old plans. We just add that one key in there. And now it's available to everybody who's subscribed to that plan. And 
everybody who's every plan that's derived from that. So for example, DevCon comes along and we have a promotion, right? We create a brand new plan for that, but that promotion might have some caveats, right? But for the most part, it inherits an existing plan and then it augments it from there. So there's a really, there's a lot of weird edge cases that you could, you can use that for. Um, I don't think you should have too much of a problem like with going big. I think it really comes down to defining what the nomenclature is for each one of those tables and all of those things. Yeah, and, and when you flatten things up, um, like inheritance, at, at that point, there's no more inheritance. So if you're curious or if you have trouble wrapping your head around, hey, um, what can someone do? You know, you just you just run the function for whatever uh, group they're in, uh, plus, plus any overwrites. Um, were there any cases where, um, like, for instance, you, you gave an example where there was East Coast and West Coast. Let's just say those two, and, and then something inheriting both of them. But if, if could there be things that are conflicting, um, East Coast and West Coast? Yeah, and really then, great, and, great question, Robert. Great question. So what happens if, if East Coast is allowed to, um, to do process A and West Coast is allowed to do process B or process A, sorry, East Coast is allowed one widget, West Coast is allowed two widgets. And I inherit both of them because I'm a manager and I work on, so how many widgets should I have? So we have to decide, do I normally sum widgets in those case? And this case, it's not because we don't have the sum on, on here. So it goes basically on the order of, of that you specify. So right here it says inherit basic user, but if I put this, remember this is a JSON, this JSON array, right? And I put in, I put West Coast. So the last one wins. The last one wins, yeah. It goes in that okay. order, right? As you'd expect an object assigned to 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 work in, in, in that order as well. Very good, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Where do okay. you, That's all I got. are all these things instantiated? Okay. Oh, oh, pardon me. Do Sorry, all these things instantiate at startup. Oh, pardon me. Sorry, would you... you would do that whenever you switch. Do users. all these start instantiate? You would do that whenever you switch users. Okay, but what about when a user is logged in and you know the time base happens and how do you kick them out of that privilege set? What do you run constantly to right, evaluate? Right. So, so because it's a custom function, depending where you stick it in, it's going to get evaluated at different times, right? It might get it evaluated once on layout load if it's a if it's a visible calc some kind of weird dependency evaluation execution tree that FileMaker has. Or if it's a script, of course, then it's program programmatic evaluation. So you're explicitly saying do this workflow and that's when it would get evaluated. Perfect. <laughs>